Hey everyone, Heather Cuesta here. This is Milestone 2, Task 1. We're looking at the work of everyone who chose to write about this black figure amphora by Exekius. During week 1, we learned to identify media and subject matter. During week 2, our aim is to focus on a set of vocabulary words that we call the elements of art and principles of design. This set of 14 vocabulary words you'll be using throughout this course and throughout your future courses at the Art Institute. Our aim here is to use the same set of words to describe works of art. So whether it's your own work that you're describing or the works of your classmates during a critique, when you, for example, use the term value, everyone will know what you mean because we've all defined it the same way. That is the relative difference between light and dark on a hypothetical scale from pure black to pure white. Okay, so our elements of art, one might think of is the actual marks an artist makes on a surface. That is the line, the color, the values, the textures, the shapes, the forms, and how they are arranged in space. The sum total of these marks on a surface might be described as a composition. And we would describe this composition using a set of terms called the principles of design. Balance, emphasis, contrast, movement, rhythm and pattern, unity, variety, and scalar proportion. So our aim here in Milestone 2 was to select a work of art and choose the elements and principles that you felt were most prominent. Okay, of the elements, line and space were the most prominent um, of your choices. And among the principles of design, um, many of you chose balance, contrast, and pattern. Okay, let's begin talking about line, uh, because line is also closely, closely related to medium. Okay, so uh, in Greek vase painting, you began with a particular shape of vase that indicated its contents. So what we're looking at here is an amphora. An amphora held liquid such as wine or olive oil, some sort of a precious, costly liquid in a container like this that was highly decorated. So here's a, uh, a global view of it, and here's another sort of close-up photograph. Okay, so we have this particular shape of vessel that was thrown on a wheel in parts and then assembled. So, for example, the handles would have been assembled separately from the wheel thrown parts. Okay, now notice how it's decorated in black and then this clay color. So what you're looking at is the natural clay color. This is not a glaze or anything. And then the black is something that we call slip, and this was painted on, and I'll explain that in just a moment. So when we use the term black figure, what we mean is that the main figures or objects are black against the clay background. Now contrast this with the red figure style. Okay, in red figure style, you'll see that the figures are red. That is the color of the clay, and then the background is black. So black figure predates red figure, and uh, Black figure, um, let me let me close zoom in just a moment. Okay, so in black figure pottery, um, one would begin with a silhouette of the figures, and then one, one would scratch back in with a stylus or a sharp point, all of these details. So all of this glorious detail, let me see if I can find a close-up. Okay, so all this glorious detail of this uh, of this fabric that's described with this um, this feast of circles and uh, concentric diamonds and zigzags and spirals. Um, they describe this very rich woven and highly decorated fabric here, but they're just line by line. This, this clearly shows the line element. So um, line in its simplest form, that is just a scratch um, on a surface. So we have very, very clear incised lines. Okay, we also have lines such as these that make up these spears. These spears were painted with a brush or a tube. And again, these are all very clear lines, um, but they're a little thicker than these incised lines. Okay, line can take a number of forms. So line doesn't necessarily have to be the direct mark of an artist. Line can also describe an edge, okay? And line can be described as curvy. It can be described as geometric or rectilinear, such as this edge right here. Line can be frenzied, or line can be very, very controlled. Line can take, a, take on its own personality. Okay, moving, 
Okay, moving on to space. Space can mean a number of different things. Space can be the arrangement of objects from side to side. Okay, space can also mean the depth. Okay, so in this case, I'm going to focus on the depth for the most part. Take a look at how the figures here are um, along, located along this ground line. Okay, and there's no indication of any sort of background. The artist has left this plane. So what we have here is an extremely shallow space. The figures are right up, um, right up close to the picture plane. We would call this edge here the picture plane. In fact, they're, they're right along it. Okay, now this space is empty. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, as one of you mentioned, it was simply to bring the focus on the figures. Um, in sort of the same way that this black slip um, covers the rest of the vase, which forces our eye right here um, on the main figures. Okay, also, uh, this story here is where Ajax and Achilles, they're both warriors, they're archers on the side of the Greek fighting the Trojans in the Trojan War, described in Homer's Iliad. They've taken a moment to pause from battle, and they're over here playing this dice game on this little table right here. They're poised and ready for battle. Their bodies are kind of tense. Notice how their legs are sort of bent as, bent as if they could spring up at any moment. They're still clutching their spears, so they're still very much engaged in battle. However, they're just taking this very, very brief moment to play a game. Okay, it's very hard to see in this picture right here. Um, in the detail view, you can see a little better. You've got all kinds of words around here. Okay, these words help to describe what is going on. Okay, so they're playing this game. Um, Achilles is the one over here on the left, and Ajax is the one over here on the right. Um, all throughout, um, these two are friends, but Achilles always seems to be the victor. He always wins when they're engaged in some sort of content. Of con contest, sorry. Okay, so the artist has um, depicted uh, Achilles being uh, more important in a number of ways. So for one thing, look how his head is slightly higher up than uh, the head of Ajax. See this? If we drew a line straight across, we'd see that uh, the head of Achilles is uh, slightly higher up. This, uh, this helmet here above his head also creates this um, even more of this height, okay? And you have this, uh, this feather that even touches the edge here. His garment is slightly more fancy. So we can see that he's, uh, but we, for the most part, we know that he's going to be the victor because um, one of these words here tells us uh, the number four. And Achilles over here, I'm sorry, Ajax has only thrown a three. So once again, Ajax wins, as he always wins. But the two are friends nonetheless. And uh, in the final analysis, Achilles actually dies first, and his friend Ajax buries him. Okay, let's move on to uh, let's move on to balance. So we've already talked about how space can be side to side, and space can also be the depth. Those of you that work in Photoshop might call this depth the z-index. I think that's a nice, nice uh, description here. You've got your y-axis, your x, your x-axis, and then your z-axis. Your z-index is your depth. Okay, so as we've seen, our depth is extremely shallow. The artist is keeping the figures very close to the picture plane. And also the figures, there's a flattening effect simply because they're silhouettes. Um, using this method of uh, black figure slip painting, it's, it's uh, kind of hard to um, indicate light and shadow to create this illusion of volume. So we have these flat shapes that, uh, that describe these figures for us. Okay, so um, incidentally, all of this black is actually not black paint. This black has taken on this color because it's oxidized in the kiln. So the artist is basically painting with a clay color. This, when Before this is fired, this is the, more of the clay color. So you have the orange of the clay, and then he's painting in this clay. And then after it's fired, it turns black. And then it's burnished to get this nice shiny surface. The painter here, his, he, uh, he was known. His name was Exekius. And uh, he was very proud of his work. And he signed most of his pots, Ezekias made me. Okay, let's talk about balance for just a moment. Okay, um, this work is extremely balanced, of course. It's symmetrical right down the center. That's the easiest way to um, 
identify balance in a composition. Now what kind of things work all that off this axis? Okay, we have these spears right here that work off this axis. Of course, you've got the symmetry of the handles here. Okay, so we definitely have symmetrical balance. So although both sides are not identical, we've already described how Achilles is slightly different from Ajax, they're still, they still have equivalent visual weight. So um, um, something that we say is balanced doesn't have to be identical, um, but visually it's weighted, um, it, has, it achieves a visual equilibrium because the parts are um, either very similar in scale or perhaps something is uh, brighter in color that offsets something that's slightly smaller. There are a number of different methods for creating this visual equilibrium. But this one is very simple. We have um, this straight up central axis that sort of divides the scene in two. We also have a very common way of dividing the space and that is in thirds. Okay, so we sort of have, uh, one could look at it a little differently and see this, um, see this division of three right here. Okay, we sort of have three um, closely equivalent compartments. Okay, contrast is also um, one of our most prominent principles of design here. Of course, we have the contrast between the, um, the black slip and the clay here. We have the contrast, the very clear contrast between the figures and the background. We also have a contrast between something that is figurative and something that is decorative. So we have this repetitive pattern here. Um, pattern and repetition were also one of your principles of design. So very clearly here we can see how the artist has used pattern, this, re this repetitive pattern to create a sense of unity. So visual, there are a number of methods that one could achieve visual unity. And one of the methods here is uh, to distribute this pattern, which is, um, they're all uh, differently shaped, but they're rough, but they're very similar in proportion. So they're all sort of these, uh, sort of these tiny little shapes. Okay, and they're distributed throughout the, um, the top and bottom of this face. Okay, in your readings, you were also introduced to something called the Fibonacci spiral. The Fibonacci spiral is a mathematical ratio of 1 to 1.618. It appears in the architecture of the Parthenon, for example. This ratio was well known to the ancient Greeks. It, was, um, it showed up in much of their architecture and in their sculpture. Okay, so this particular ratio, 1 to 1.618, shows up all over the place in nature. It's uh, the most well-known expression of this ratio is in the size of the chambered nautilus shell. That is the, um, the size of each one of these compartments as it enlarges and creates this spiral. You can also plot out a Fibonacci spiral mathematically. So if you begin with a rectangle that is uh, that has the measurement of 1 on one side and 1.618 on the other, divide a square out of it, what you'll be left with is another, another one of these Fibonacci rectangles with the same proportion, 1 to 1.618. So you'll see this same mathematical ratio work out. Um, you'll see it very often in the pattern of seeds. Um, this is very interesting, the galaxies and the hurricanes, we see this spiral, this particular, um, it's not a tight spiral, it's not a loose spiral, it's a particular spiral formed by this ma mathematical equation. Okay, moving back up here to our amphora. Okay, note how, note the shape of this, of this amphora right here. It's not short and squatty, it's not tall and thin. Take a look at this, this is very interesting. Look at this particular swell of this curve right here. Sorry, and look, look how nicely that fits. Okay, so uh, the potter was um, obviously, um, obviously knew the Fibonacci ratio and uh, made this pot in this particular lovely slope. Okay, so thanks everyone. I appreciate your work here and I look forward to what you've come up with next. So thank you very much for your efforts.